Well, good day to all of you. So, uh, in the last two classes, I have already completed the introduction, and by this time, you know that what uh, what is uh, 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 what is a phase. Of course, I had completed to men uh, rather I forgotten to mention what a phase is. A phase is that portion of matter which is uniform throughout in physical structure and chemical composition, or in other words, it is a homogeneous piece of matter. So, therefore, any system that we select that may comprise of single phase or that, that may comprise of more than one phases. Okay. Now, when we have a system comprising of more than one phases, then naturally within that particular system, the two phases are going to interact till both the phase phases they settle down to an equilibrium state. And in thermodynamics, what are we going to we are going to study particularly? We are going to study the properties or the relationships between properties of the two phases of any particular system. And when there are when the system as a whole interacts with the surroundings by virtue of either heat or work, how the states of the two phases they change, how they are connected, and what are the relationships governing phase equilibrium when two or more phases are in equilibrium within any particular system. Now, before we go to two phase systems, first thing which we are going to deal with is the simplest thing we are going to deal with homogeneous systems or single phase systems. We are going to find out the relationships between the properties of the different single phase or homogeneous systems and the relationships of these properties with the energy interactions which the system has with the surroundings. We are going to take up closed systems first and then we are going to deal with open systems or rather we are going to, going to uh, extend the, uh, the analysis for open systems at one end and isolated systems at the other end. So, therefore, after we study the energy interactions, next we need to know that whether any process is possible in a system or not or whether there are some processes which are possible, some processes which occur spontaneously to bring about a change in a system and some processes they are not possible and we need to ex expend energy to for them or to rather to make them happen. In other words, we shall be discussing in brief about the feasibility of the different processes which a system may, may undergo. And after that, once we have understood more or less the heat work or rather the energy interactions between a system and surroundings, for the time being, if initially we are going to take single phase systems, we understand whether what are the feasible processes in the system. Then we, uh, the next thing which we go, which we do is before going into the details of phase equilibrium, we are going to deal with single component two phase systems, and then we go for two component or multi component multi phase systems. So, gradually we proceed and as we proceed the complexity increases and uh, as I have already mentioned in my introdu introductory lecture that since many of you will be interested in petroleum refineries etcetera. So, I will be touching upon some portions of hydrocarbon thermodynamics, the remaining can be clarified from the book of Edminster or any other book which you find is relevant. Now, the entire the paradigm of thermodynamics, it is governed by primarily the two laws along with the zeroth law and the third law of thermodynamics which is also there. Now, these two laws they had originated from a series of experiments which had been performed by Joule and Kelvin between 1843 to 1848. They are known as the famous paddle pool experiments what did they do? The experiments were very simple at that time, they were quite crude, but they came up with some very, very important observations which formed the basis of the two important laws of thermodynamics. What was the experiment that they did? The experiment was they had contained water in a insulated vessel and in that particular vessel, it was connected with uh, some particular, it was connected with a paddle wheel and this particular paddle wheel, it was rotated by the lowering of the mass which was attached to the pulley arrangement on the top. So, therefore, what the, these two scientists, they had tried to do, they had rotated this particular paddle wheel 
with quite sufficient speed and they had heated the water contained in the vessel. Okay. And how much amount of work was done or how much amount of heat was uh, rather how much amount of work was done on this particular water that could be manifested only by a change of state of this system from an initial temperature T 1 to a, to a final temperature T 2 which was noted by means of the thermometer. Now, after the paddle wheel they also used other types of uh, other types of devices to perform work on this same volume of water kept in an insulated rigid container. They found out that no matter whatever device they used in order to perform this amount of work, it was found that the amount of work performed was proportional to the amount of temperature increase. For each case the temperature increase they had maintained the temperature increase as constant and they found out that for each case the amount of work performed was proportional to the temperature increase which occurred. And after each experiment after the temperature increase what they did they broke the insulation and immersed this volume of water inside a water bath to bring it back to the original temperature. And there they could find out what was the heat given up to the amount of water contained in the water bath. Now, this particular experiment which they did, they found two very important observations which form the basis of the first law and the second law of thermodynamics. The first thing as I have already mentioned, they found out that the amount of work done was proportional to the temperature increase in, in each case no matter how the work was performed. And they observed that whenever the system it undergoed the cyclic change, what was the cyclic change? When the initial and final states of the system are the same, mind it cyclic changes can be reversible, they can be irreversible. It is important to remember that for reversible cyclic changes both the system and the surroundings come back to their original state and for a irreversible cyclic change it is the system which is brought back to its original state, the surroundings does not come. Well, they performed a series of irreversible experiments because as we have already discussed it is not possible to obtain reversible processes or reversible cyclic processes in practice. So, what did they find? They found out that whenever a system was undergoing a cyclic change, however complex a cycle may be, it was found that the cyclic integral of d q was always proportional to the cyclic integral of d w, where the constant of proportionality was 1 in s i units. As a result of which the first law can be mathematically expressed as given in this particular as this particular expression. Now, from this particular expression they found out some very important observations which led to the law of conservation of energy as we all know. It is important for us to remember that first law does not directly give you the law of conservation of energy, it is a consequence of first law. In this particular experiment they also had another very important observation. They found out that when they were performing a work the temperature was increasing and then when, when after the temperature increase they uh, broke down the insulation and immersed this particular volume of uh, water in a water bath when it gave up heat and came back to its original state. The same experiment was performed as I have already mentioned by different ways of work. The same process was followed and people found out that it was possible for going from state 1 to state 2 in a by, by, during their experiments. That is they could heat up by performing work for all the experiments, but the reverse process could not be performed they could not use the heat content of this particular system in order to lower this particular weight. So, this was another very important observation they found out or in other words they could not first use the heat in order to perform work although it the law of conservation of energy was obeyed in the process. So, therefore, these were the two observations first thing was the 
was that the as is shown by this mathematical statement from where we are going to see shortly we arrive at the law of conservation of energy and the second observation was while the doing work and increasing the temperature of the system is a feasible one the reverse process could not be performed and if we have to use heat transfer in order to perform some amount of work they found out that some amount of heat has to be lost to a surrounding at lower temperature and only with the remaining amount of heat some amount of useful work can be performed. Thus, while the entire amount of work can be converted to heat, the entire amount of heat cannot be converted to work as a result of which now we know that heat is a lower grade of energy as compared to mechanical energies. So, these were the two observations based on which the two laws of thermodynamics were formulated. Let us now see the formulation of the first law of thermodynamics. As I have told you, it gives you the uh, equation as d q. Well, I will just mention that it is not the these here are not cut. So, therefore, they do not show an exact uh, differential. This is a typographical error which has happened, but uh, you please remember during your uh, studies, uh, it is very important that you, you show the inexact differentials by I either this thing or you can also, also write it down as delta q minus delta w. In the class, I will be cutting the d's to denote inexact differentials. So, therefore, from this particular process, suppose again I, I since all of these, suppose I assume reversible processes and I plot the reversible processes not on a p v plot, but on a generalized f r plot where f is a generalized thermodynamic driving force, r is a generalized displacement. Now, here suppose my initial state was 1. From this initial state, I go to the state 2 by a reversible process which can be plotted. Reversible process 1 a 2 which can be shown by a solid line here. And I come back from here by another reversible process 2 b 1. Now, my entire process 1 a 2 b 1 is a cyclic reversible cyclic process. So, for this entire process I can write down that integral of 1 a 2 b 1 d q minus integral 1 a 2 b 1 d w this is equal to 0. So, therefore, I can also break it down and write it down as d q 1 a 2 plus integral d q 2 b 1 minus integral d w 1 a 2 minus integral d w 2 b 1 this is equal to 0. I can rearrange it and write it down as <coughs> integral d q minus d w 1 a 2 plus integral d q minus d w 2 b 1 this is equal to 0. I can write it down in this particular way. Now, instead of 2 b 1, I can also come back by another process and again a reversible process by a different path which is 2 c 1. So, for this particular 1 a 2 c 1, for this particular cyclic integral also, I can write it down as 1 a 2 c 1 d q minus integral d w 1 a 2 c 1, this is equal to 0. In the same way, I can break it down and I can write it down as integral 1 a 2 d q plus integral 2 c 1 d q minus integral 1 a 2 d w minus integral 2 c 1 d w that is equal to 0. Now, if I subtract equation 2 from equation 1, what am I going to get? I will just write down the equations once more for your convenience. 
and then I perform this subtraction. First equation is 1 a 2 plus d q 2 b 1 minus d w 1 a 2 minus integral d w 2 b 1 equals to 0. And the second equation is d q 1 a 2 plus d q 2 c 1 again d w 1 a 2 d w 2 c 1 equals to 0. Now, if I subtract one from the other, what do I get? I find that these d q's and these d w's they cancel out and what do I get? I get integral d q to b 1 minus integral d q to c 1 <coughs> minus integral d w to b 1 minus integral d w to c 1 this whole thing equal to 0 or in other words can I write it down as integral d q minus d w to b 1 this is equal to, to integral d q minus d w to c 1. Can I write it down in this particular way? And moment I have written it down in this particular way, can you tell me what does it imply? It implies that d q it depends upon the path, d w depends upon the path, but the difference between d q and d w that is equal for both the paths 2 b 1 and 2 c 1. When the initial state and the final state, the initial state is 2 in both cases, the final state is 1 in both cases, when the initial and final states are the same, then the difference between 2 d q and d w, this particular quantity remains the same. What does it mean? It means that d q mine although d q is a path function, d w is a path function, the difference between the two must be a state function and that should depend upon the initial state and the final state. And this particular difference, the, the, the difference between d q and d w, this is stored as internal energy or as energy of the system and this energy of the system it depends upon the initial state and the final state. It does not matter whether we are coming from the initial to the final state via path C or via path B, the, the difference is the same. This is nothing but E 2 minus E 1, right. So, therefore, from here what do we get? We get rather the first thing which we get is that the <coughs> difference between these two is equal to the energy stored in the system and this particular energy stored this delta E this is a property of the system. This delta E this is this comprises of the kinetic energy of the system, the potential energy of the system and also the internal energy of the system plus uh, and this internal energy it comprises of the energy of the ultimate particles which comprises of the, of uh, the different uh, motions of the molecules etcetera etcetera. And this is the internal energy which was manifested by the increase in temperature in this paddle field experiment. Usually in thermodynamics we deal with non stationary uh, sorry we deal with stationary systems which do not have much displa displacement. So, therefore, usually these two terms are 0 and therefore, delta E reduces to delta U. And therefore, from here we get that for a closed system d q minus d w equals to d U. This occurs for a closed system. So, therefore, for a closed system we can always say that the net energy change in the system is equal to the net energy transfer across the system boundary. Now, what happens for an isolated system? For an isolated system we know that it does not allow any sort of work either or rather any sort of interaction between the system and the surroundings. So, therefore, for an isolated system what do we get? d q equals to 0 
d w equals to 0 which naturally brings you to the d a for an isolated system equal to 0 which is nothing but the principle of conservation of energy. So, therefore, we find that for that from the first law what do we get? We find that for closed systems the net energy change of the system is equal to the net energy interaction between the system and the surroundings and energy is conserved for an isolated system. Within an isolated system, suppose there are differences in driving force between two parts of the system, then definitely the two parts will interact, but the total energy of the system remains constant, which is known as the principle of conservation of energy. And this particular principle of conservation of energy, it includes all types of energy, including the kinetic energy or the mechanical energy, the internal energy and so on and so forth. Now, from here what do we get for an open system? For an open system what do we have? Let us see. Suppose we and let me remind you for most of the things that we, that we work out a chemical reactor, a nozzle, a pump, a compressor most of these they deal with open systems. Now, for open systems suppose I take up an open system in this particular manner. It is just a black box because it can be anything. So, therefore, I take it up as a black box. So, say for example, it can be a reactor, it can be anything. So, from here we find that at pressure P 1 some amount of uh, volume is entering. Here the pressure is P 2 and some amount of volume V 2 goes out. Here we find that shaft work uh, possibly th this particular device it performs some amount of shaft work may or may not perform some amount of heat enters in this particular system. And then in we find that here some additional work is required other than the shaft work to push this volume of fluid inside and this work is done on the system. So, therefore, it is negative work and some amount of work the system does to push out the some volume of liquid or some volume of, uh, of, of the system out through it. So, therefore, this was my reactor and what do I do? In order to use the first law for, uh, for open sorry for closed systems, I need to keep the mass of the system constant. So, therefore, I devise my system such that its mass remains constant while the some particular fluid it keeps on flowing through it and the device interacts with the surrounding by virtue of work and heat. So, what do we do? We assume that the system comprises of the amount of mass which is contained in this particular control volume and the amount of mass which is going to enter in this control volume during time d t. So, therefore, at time t this is my system, this whole thing is my system and at time t plus d t I assume that my system has some amount of mass has gone out through this. So, now my system changes into this particular configuration. So, what do I find? I find that my system comprises of a fixed mass of gas which is enclosed by a flexible boundary and I break my entire process into small small time scales d t. During this time scale d t say some amount of mass delta m is entering the system, some amount of mass delta m is going out of the system. So, therefore, at time t my, my particular system comprises of the entire mass here, mass here plus the delta m mass which is going to enter here and at time t plus d t the my system comprises of the, the, the mass which has already entered and the mass which has gone out during this time t plus d t. Now, in this particular case what is my d w? d w definitely will comprise of the shaft work and along with that it is going to comprise of the work which was done on the fluid so that it can enter and the work which the system did on the fluid such that it can go out. 
So, therefore, the total work in this case comprises of the shaft work and the work which was done on the system in pushing this fluid plus the work done by the system in pushing out the fluid. So, therefore, in this particular case my d q equals d e equals to d q minus d w, where this particular d w can be written down as <coughs> minus p 2 v 2 delta m minus d w shaft. Right. So, therefore, in and for, for stationary systems where the, uh, there is no potential energy change also for those particular cases E can be written down as u. So, therefore, in this particular case I get u 2 minus u 1 into delta m this is nothing but equal to d q sorry d q minus d w shaft plus p 1 v 1 delta m minus p 2 v 2 delta m. Or in other words, if I bring the here to this side, I get u 2 plus p 2 v 2 delta m minus u 1 plus p 1 v 1 delta m, this is equal to d q minus d w shaft. This is my first law for open systems. I am sorry this delta m should have been here, this delta I am sorry for making this mistake or in other words what I get is, I get that for this particular for open systems what I get that while in closed systems my <coughs> d q minus d w was equal to d u. In this case I find that d q minus d w shaft this is equal to some particular term which also has which is a property of this system and has the units of energy that is u 2 plus p 2 v 2 here u 1 plus p 1 v 1. And as possibly you are aware of this fact that u plus p v is nothing but the we have defined it with another particular property group which is known as the enthalpy of the system. So, therefore, for open systems we can write it down as we can write it down as d h which equal to d q minus d w shaft. For closed systems we had d u was equal to d q minus d w. Now, suppose we take a closed system at constant volume what happens and suppose we assume that the only work which can be performed is p v work or in other words d w equals to p d v. So, in this case for constant volume work done is equal to 0 and d u equals to d q. Suppose I take up a constant pressure process and or other isobaric process again assume only p v work is done. So, in this case d w equals to p d v which is nothing but equal to d p v as well is not it. So, therefore, for this particular case what do I find? We find for this particular case d of u plus p v equals to d q. The same u plus p v which I had got in a for a closed system. I find that we have come across the same u plus p v for an isobaric closed system as well. So, we find that this particular term u plus p v which also has a property of energy. So, this we encounter very frequently. So, instead of writing u plus p v every time we, we thought of defining it as one particular term and we define this particular term as the enthalpy of the system. So, therefore, from the first law what did we do? We found out that the first law deduces the law of conservation of energy for an isolated system and it gave the 
the the uh, the law as d u equals to d q minus d w for a closed system and particularly since as we know that we are primarily very frequently we encounter isobaric processes for isobaric processes this reduces to d q equals to d h and also for open systems we find the law reduces to d q minus d w shaft equals to d h. So, at the end of the first law we have defined two new properties one is the internal energy of the system and the other is the enthalpy of the system. Next class I would like to elaborate on a little more on the enthalpy of the system and I would like also to talk about the how much amount of temperature rise we can we can obtain by some particular heat interaction between the system and the surroundings or I would like to discuss a little more about the heat capacities and the specific heat capacities of the systems before I close the first law and go for the second law of thermodynamics. Thank you very much.